Okay, everybody. How's everybody today? Well, I hope you had a great Memorial Day weekend. I did. And uh, looking forward to uh, a couple more days of work and then uh, going to Florida with my wife. She's a teacher. She gets out on Thursday. And we go visit some friends. And, and I'm going to be in Florida next week. The weather should be nice down there. All right. So. Uh, what are we doing today? We're doing the uh, packet number four. I call this the package packet. And you might wonder, why am I calling this the package packet? Because if you look at the the various things that we're going to be cover, covering, it's, you know, mutual funds, closing funds, you know, all the mutual funds are is a way of packaging, open-end mutual funds. Are ways of packaging stocks, bonds, precious metals, uh, real estate, uh, you know, commodities. I mean, there's there's funds for everything in this world. Closed-end funds, many many closed-end funds out there. So there's so UATs. There's a way of packaging. Uh, it used to be just bonds. Now it's uh, stocks too. Uh, so so on and so forth. So this is the packaging of all the different types of investments that are out there. So that's why I call it the package. Packet. All right. Let's go on. Let's get rolling here. Uh, today we will finish by 8 o'clock. Uh, there's a lot of talking going on in this one because there's just a lot of stuff. And I'm just going to try to highlight a few key, key things you should, I would be concerned with if I was in your shoes going forward. I know there's a lot of reading. And uh, and think about this: the majority of financial planners out there deal with the regular Tom, Dick, and Harry out there, right? The the individuals that need the financial planning, whether they're middle class, lower class, upper class, who cares? You know, there's, there are planners that do work with the real high net worth, ultra super accredited type investors. I mean, we do know that does happen out there, but the majority of you will be dealing with individuals that are not considered uh, to be that accredited or super accredited. They might have assets uh, 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, or whatever the case would be. So the bottom line is, do you think that many of them are going to be using mutual funds? And the answer is yes. Do you think uh, they'll be using ETFs? Yes. And, then, and some of these other packaging things. And so do you think that the CFP board, when they give you their final exam, that comprehensive exam, will have a question or two from this particular packet specifically on funds and, and rules and regulations associated with them and, and an understanding of how they work and things of that nature. And the answer is yes. So I highly recommend if you're not in the industry that you maybe read this packet of information. I mean, I'm talking the uh, the you know, textbook part on mutual funds. Maybe you know a couple of different times because you know you read through it and there's a lot of stuff being said. And then if you reread it a second time, you might be able to pick up on some key points. I'll try to pinpoint some of those key points going forward. Okay. All right, but uh, let's let's jump into FDIC insurance. Um, should you be aware of FDIC insurance? Sure, you should, because you know many people are concerned about uh, their investments and/or their money that they have put away. You know, is there some insurance to it? You know, what is the insurance that the investment world gives you? Is SIPC, S-I-P-C, and we know that uh, gives coverage in brokerage accounts up to five hundred thousand, and then most of those firms will have some additional coverage for their clients. Uh, that have uh, securities in there, but that's you know what are they insuring? They're insuring the fact that you know that uh, if if there's bankruptcy or or if something ever happens to that particular firm where your securities are being held, that you will be able to retrieve and get back if that the extra securities the money. Uh, well, FTAC does the same thing for the banks. Right, because depending on the, the type of accounts you have registered at those particular banks, they will churn up to a certain dollar amount. Well, how much are we talking about? So let's take a look. First of all, uh, opening bullet point up here kind of states 
that the FDIC insurance was created. You know, why? When was this created? Back in '33, because you you come in the stand when we had the uh, the big uh, 1929. Uh, Great Depression and, and everything that took place during that period of time, a lot of banks uh, went under and a lot of people lost some money and, and, and the U.S. government says, hey, we better do something about that. So they created the FDIC insurance and what they have done recently is they've changed. It used to be 100000 and now it's a depositor has 250000 insurance per type of account per institution. Now, you know, when, it, when, when we talk about per type of account, what are we referring to when we say per type? I'm not talking about a, I'm talking about registration type. I think you should be familiar with that term of type, meaning registration type. Ownership categories is what they're looking at. Not the type of a bank product that is issued, it's the ownership category and then of course the money that's inside of that is the you know will be where the you know the money's in the product All right so looking at what I mean by that is the and when you when you have a question if they give you a question on FDIC insurance you know you need to break it down and, and say okay if I'm dealing with someone who is an individual that that individual in the aggregate, we'll have 250000 So in other words, that individual might have an individual savings account and an individual checking account. Well, you know, that individual will only be covered for $250,000. If they're in the joint account approach, then each person owns 50% of the, of, the, uh, of the account, and each one will get 250000 you know, for that particular part, I believe. Okay? Um, this testamentary accounts, even the trust accounts, uh, and IRA retirement accounts. So there's, there's four of them. Okay, now you see this payable on death part over here? Payable on death, is that a, a specific type of an account? Or do you add a payable on death uh, feature to a bank account? Okay, so as an example, if Tom Rose had an individual account up here and wanted to have that money in there passed to somebody um, and not go through probate, because if it's just registered in my name um, and it will go, you know, and I pass away, it goes to my estate, and then my estate is probated. Correct. So. If I wanted to bypass the probate portion of that, I can add a payable on death feature to that, which allows me to turn around and and, and actually put a beneficiary onto my account. So I don't think the payable on death POD, you know, is a is a, an account by itself. I think it's just an add-on. That's how I would approach it. I've never seen. I never thought I could walk into a bank and say, "Hey, I like to have one of those payable on death accounts." I've never heard anybody ask that question, and never. I've never done that. Does anybody here in class have you ever gone in and asked for a POD account? And the answer is probably not. If you have, give me a. Uh, yeah, I'm going to clear off the green check and I'm going to ask you guys, uh, give me a red X if, it, if you never did it, but if you did do it and ask for just a pure old POD, give me a green check. So red X says, nah, never did it. Green check says, yeah, I went in and asked for a POD. Okay, looks like the majority of you uh, did that. Okay. Yeah, so just keep that in mind, all right? Um, so four different types of registration. Beneficiary, not POD. Valerie, what do you mean by that? Uh, is this different from naming a beneficiary? You know, when you put a POD on an account, it acts like a beneficiary. Same idea, okay? But um, beneficiaries are only show up in in IRA accounts. They have beneficiaries for IRA accounts. Um, if you have an annuity, you can add a, a beneficiary to that. 
Okay, so there are only certain types of investment uh, vehicles that can be used, uh, or actually IRS type of vehicles that could be used and uh, and have beneficiaries built into the contract because you know annuity is a contract, life insurance policy is a contract, and then has a beneficiary. Right. If you open up a bank account by itself, it's not a contract, okay? But you can go ahead and then the POD, payable on death, to that particular account, and it would act like a beneficiary for that account. Now, uh, learn, you might want to write this down for yourself. If I'm dealing with a, uh, a brokerage account, and they open it up in my name, say Tom Rose uh, Brokerage Account at uh, Merrill Lynch, right? Uh, and I pass away, all my assets, the value of my assets will go into my estate for estate tax purposes and for, uh, and then to be probated, okay? Is there a way that I can take my account and have it trans, you know, and have it payable to somebody? If I pass away, and the answer is yeah, and if I do that, it would be a TOD, transfer on death. So TODs are used on securities, PODs are used on bank accounts. You should know that. Okay. TOD on securities. PODs on bank accounts. Uh, third bullet point down here, if the IC does not cover stocks, mutual funds, bonds, money market mutual funds, nor annuities. Okay, right? So in other words, you don't get FDIC insured. So that's why when you sometimes uh, people who go into banks and they go over to one of the private bankers, and if they get into a mutual fund or whatever, they have to disclose, hey, you, you do understand that, you know, your investing uh, is not covered under the FDIC rules. So that's what they're kind of saying on that one. And then if you make deposits outside the United States, you know, FDIC is not going to go, and if you have an account in, in uh, England or in Germany or something like that, they're not going to give you FDIC insurance over there at this point, okay? All right, so know some of the rules to this FDIC insurance. Having said that, look at this question here. John and Mary are the following accounts at a local bank. And this would be a great question, I think, for a camp exam. Or they would, you know, if, if, if they feel, you know, because, you know, this is a kind of an estate planning type of situation also, where you would need to know, you know, how do you, you know, set up and, and avoid probate and things of that nature, but it's also, is, is it an investment question? Yeah, it depends on how you want to look at it. But you've got these people here. Can you determine um, how they fare out when, when it comes to what kind of coverage do they have? Okay, so one of the things you might want to do for yourself is you might want to take a look at and, and break it down into, uh, as an example, here, John, I'm trying to uh, put a box around John's, check it in John's CD, and then I'm getting knocked off here. Come on, guys, let's work. There we go. All right. Oh, well. Sorry, guys, I can't seem to get the. Uh, my stuff working. John has a Chinese account. John has a CD. John is an individual in both of these situations. Keep that in mind. Mary has a checking. That's hers by herself. Okay. Oh, we have a joint. What are the rules for joint? Oh, we have a joint CD and a joint checking, so you're going to have to kind of maybe consider how that kind of comes together. 
and here's a trust. So what do we have on here? We've got an individual, the first two that are shown here deal with the uh, let's see if we get this going here. There we go. All right. First two here individual. Individual, so let's put the letter I up here for the individual. I for the individual. We got a joint situation. Call it a JT. Last one here was a, a trust. And uh, so we got three. Three of the uh, breakdowns, what we don't have on this particular page is something to do with an IRA or a phone type of thing. And I'm looking at the uh, chat and it says, Rebecca, I work at a credit union and the apprenticeship list has a PFD on the membership application. Okay. And I'm, all, right, as, all right, so you still open it up as an individual at the credit union, Rebecca, right? And POD is that if you want to add, you know, so they just kind of blended in uh, that POD arrangement to that application process, which is good. That's great. You know, it, it hasn't been that way all the time. I can remember, um, you know, if it was true, why won't many accounts have it already on there? And many accounts do not have that already on there because they weren't offered the, the POD arrangement, just like in the investments. Um, unless I bring it up to my clients uh, to put a COD on there, uh, many of them open up and uh, mutual funds in their name and, and don't have it, an arrangement made that what happens if something happens to them. Okay, so very important to be, be aware of that type of stuff. So, you know, you got this type of a question and the question is, you know, how much is that covered by the FDIC insurance? You go to your next slide. And they reiterated the same numbers under balance, and then they're and they're breaking it down for John as to you know the FDIC insureds and make their and then if you read what is on the bottom of this particular slide here, that tells you that the in John's situation right here, that this two hundred seventy five thousand total aggregate. And twenty five thousand would not be covered by FDIC insureds. Notice on the joint how they broke the, the joint down here into a uh, split that three hundred sixty thousand hundred eighty into each one of the two uh, under fifty percent under John, fifty percent under Mary. But then you had to make sure you added the the joint 1770, so just so happens that it adds up to 250 total, that is totally covered. But if the joint CD was, say, 150,000, you know, it would not be covered. You know, 10,000 would not be covered. Mary's Trust, we know, is covered up to 250, and there's 100 right there. So, so practice makes perfect. If you can, I would highly recommend that you guys consider the following. I had a, uh, um, I don't know if I was at a bank or where I was, and I got one of these FDIC insurance booklets. Now, mine is updated through 2010, and I eventually need to go ahead and order myself a new one. But I'm going to give you an 800 number that you can call and, and order one if you wanted to, and probably there's a, uh, they have a, a website. So let's come and let me put that up here for you. The, the telephone number, if you wanted to call and order one of those FDIC booklets. And you know what I like about the booklet is that they give you, they go through each of those different types. You remember I mentioned the there's the joint or the individual, then there's the joint, and then there's the tr ownership categories of the uh, uh, trusts and uh, things of that nature. So, And then they give you examples of each one of them. And I think it's, it was worth the while to look at it. So the 800 number, if you wanted to make the call, is one eight seven seven two seven five. 
Okay, that's two, seven, five. That's a two here. Three, three, four, two. Three, three, four, two. All right, that's that one. Now, if you want to just uh, go to the uh, website, www. W, as we all know, Dr. Lloyd, FDIC, FDIC, G. Wilson, dot gov. And then you can take it from there. You probably, it's probably more you can add on to that or just go to FDIC, dot gov. And then it, maybe they'll give you a, a complete listing. Maybe they'll have the book right under you. You could either uh, save it to your computer or you could download certain pages from that if you wanted to. Okay. Alright, okay. All right, Dan, um, you had a question about John's checking and yeah. CD being separate? Right, I mean, the this answer? is kind of a confusing uh, thing here. You have 200, it's the way this looks like. He has FDIC coverage for 200 and for 75. And then earlier on the previous uh, slide said each of the accounts, each separate account is insured for up to 250. Okay. Yeah, I think the way whoever put the slide together could have maybe, let's clean this up for a second. Uh, what you're referring to, I believe, is give me a second here. Okay, the way this is stated, FDIC coverage two hundred and seventy five. Um, they they probably, you know, would have been better off somehow, you know, covering it in the fact of John, John by himself. Let's let's do this way. John all by himself is an individual, so you have to aggregate all of it together. So it's not per account; it's per registration type. It's not like this checking is gets 250 by itself, and the CD gets. 250 by itself. Okay, not if it's only in the registration of John all by himself. John gets 250 total combined. Okay, so they're saying, okay, well, would the FDIC insurance, you know, I'm not trying to interpret the way the, the guy tried to present it on the slide, but this should be, you know, they're trying to say to you, yeah, there's 275, that's 275, but only 250 counts. Is I think how you have to back into it. Does that make any sense? That's it. Yeah, it's per person. Per registration type. Okay. Because Mary by herself has 250 for all her aggregate stuff. As joint Okay, as in joint, it's 250 aggregate. So this just happens to work out right here. But that's why I try to say, what if this CD here was 150? Okay, if I would have brought over and put 75 down here, And 75 down on this one here. As you, if you add them together, there, that's 150, uh, 255,000. And 255 is not covered. 250 is covered. Okay, so you guys got to remember 250. So go back to that previous slide if we could, and and remember that. It's per type, per
per registration type. See, I would have used per registration type of account. Just to make sure you understand it's the registration that's on the account. And they said over here, individuals get 250. Joints split it 50-50, but each one will get 250. Trusts, 250. IRAs, 250. But there are some rules on trusts. If there's five beneficiaries in a trust, each one gets 250. So that's what this, I learned from this booklet. You might want to, like I said, you might want to get, get a hold of the booklet and um, to make sure you, you, you get all the numbers right. Because again, this is a great question, I think, for the comp exam. All right, because how many people go to the bank? Quite a few. And hopefully, of course, those that are working at the bank would have made sure that a client was covered properly and, and they understood the rules of FDIC insurance if you're putting a lot of money in these accounts. All right, enough said on that stuff. Let's move off of uh, FDIC insurance. You know, this... Um, this slide here, 3-1 and 3-2 and 4-1, which deals with money market funds, I want to skip that and come back to it, okay? Because if we're if we're getting into mutual funds, let's talk about the term open in investment companies. You know, mutual funds, if I said the word mutual funds, you should say to me open end investment companies. Mutual funds, also known as open-end investment companies. There are three different types of investment companies that we're going to talk about today. Open-end is one of them. Closed-end is the second one. Unit investment trusts will be the third one. Those three fall under investment companies. Okay, so when you're going through the slides, when you're reading your book, you, you should do yourself a favor and say, if I'm looking at an open-end mutual fund as an example, and I see that the you know one of the benefits that they have here for open-end investment companies is that you you can by buying a mutual fund you get diversification because of the amount of securities, stocks in the stock fund that are purchased by the money manager. Right? Then it would be pretty well diversified as a mutual fund. Well, can a closed-end fund be diversified? And the answer is yes. All right? So maybe as you go through these things, you can say to yourself, well, um, you know, you're learning it. It's, you should say open end versus closed end. Yes, that's the same because there are similarities between those types of investment companies and those types of funds, open end and closed end. But there are going to be certain things that are not common between the two that are dissimilar or not similar. You know, and we'll get to those in a second. Our we know that open-end funds are professionally managed. Well, are closed-end funds professionally managed? Yeah, they are. Okay. Now, you might say, well, should I do that also with ETFs? And the answer is, well, if it fits, it doesn't hurt to, to know certain things. Okay. Uh, do you have stated investment objectives for open-end? Yes. And how about closed-end? Yep. Uh, do most of those open and closed-end funds have shareholder services? Yep. Both of them do. Okay, so so we don't get too complicated on it. You know, let's just see. if we see something that's going to be similar to both. Let's. I'm going to try to point it out. If it's different, I'll try to point that out to you a little bit. Okay. When you solve for NAV, do you know how to solve for NAV on an open and mutual fund? I don't know if. If I like this, uh, you know, uh, this morning I was going reviewing my notes here, 
and I said to myself, net assets minus net liabilities. Oh wait, what does a net asset mean to you? To me, a net asset means they already took out the uh, uh, various things. In other words, I, I almost want to call this, instead of, if I was going to rewrite this particular statement here, I would get rid of the word net and, and maybe call it gross assets. Gross assets minus liabilities will equal your net assets. And then you take that those net assets and then you divide it by the number of shares outstanding. Okay, so what are what are these liabilities we're talking about in open end mutual funds? Well, they're the it's the expense ratio. You know how much money's in or what's included in expense ratio, and we do know that in expense ratio. Well, let's let's find a slide that talks about some of these uh, these fees here. There we go. Let's see, this is slide number um, give me a second. Look at page six dash two. Six dash two will take you to the fees and expenses in the fund. You have the management fee. The money manager of the mutual fund has to get paid, okay, and then that management fee also probably includes in there the uh, cost for research and, and that type of stuff also. So anything associated with the management fee, the operating expenses, more of the administrative type of stuff associated with the fund and running the fund. Uh, marketing 12B1 fees are included in an expense ratio. Uh, if there are any custodial record keeping fees, those are included in there. So those are your fees that are in, included in your expense ratio. You should know that. Notice the one that is not trading costs not included in the calculation. They're in the prospectus. They talk about the the trading cost range, and that's you know when these money managers are actually buying and selling their particular securities. They have to do you know they have to pay for that. It's not free to them, even though they might get a great low cost. You know, but they're doing such big volume of trading. There's still costs involved, but that's not part of expense ratio. Again, if I was sitting back and as a CFP board thinking. What kind of questions would be appropriate on mutual funds, you know, because, you know, fees are, are an important topic of discussion with clients. And do they know how to explain fees associated with mutual funds? I think that's something that would be a great type of a question to come at you with. All right, so you should be aware of the expenses associated with it. So let's go back to this particular slide, which is on 4-2, and when they get to this NAV, when they talk about gross assets, how do they determine the gross assets? They take the number of shares that they own in a particular fund, multiply it times the share price, you know, is that coming up with that market capitalization numbers for, for all the securities that they own? And they have to say that you know, say that fund then has a billion dollars worth of value in it. Then they divide by the number of shares outstanding to come up with a particular NAV share price. You got to know that. So it's the it's the gross 
assets, all the you know, take all your the shares times the number, the the price of the stocks and all that type of stuff. Come up with that big market capitalization number for that particular fund, divided by all the shares outstanding for that particular fund, and you come up with a net asset value price. Okay. In the open end funds, and here's one of those things that would be different down here on the bottom, the bottom bullet point right here. That, um, okay, as soon as I, there we go. Infinite capitalization shares continuously offered for sale on a closed end fund. There's a fixed number of shares that were issued sold what we would consider outstanding you know shares out there in the marketplace they don't make new shares there's only a certain amount of closed end fund shares in the open end fund a lot different right I want to buy into the American Growth Fund as an example, and I got ten thousand dollars. You know what is the NAV price? What's the public offering price? Public offering price. What's the public offering price? I just talked about NAV over here. Well, public offering price is because American Funds has a share class that has a sales charge attached to it. Um, the client buys in at the public offering price. Okay, and that public offering price is usually higher than the NAV. If the investor wants to sell out of the fund at the American funds, they get the they get the NAV price. So the public offering price is to buy it, NAV is to sell it. If it's a no load fund, they buy in at the NAV and they sell out at the NAV. Those are things that you should become familiar with. If you're not in the business, you may be going, What are you talking about? Well, you got to learn the lingo associated with funds. But if everybody in this class went to the American funds and everybody gave them $10,000, you, we all, and, and we all were going to buy that American growth fund, we would all get shares in that American growth fund. Why? Because they'll make those shares. There's no set limit for the amount of shares that could be in the American Growth Fund. They could stop and close the door and say, hey, there's, we're not going to allow new investors to come in. Okay, that just says, okay, we're not going to allow new ones coming in. We're not going to take any more new money in. Now, what if I was a client of the American Growth Fund? What if I already had shares? Would I be allowed to... to contribute more money and many times even though it's closed to new investors it's still open to existing investors and they can still buy in and get more shares all right so you need to be familiar with terminology associated with open-end investment companies um, everybody if you're dealing with an open fund you are doing all your transactions through the fund company you are not trading those stacks on an exchange, closed end funds you tr you you buy and sell on on an exchange. Open end is directly to the company. Okay, now how many funds are out there? Well, they say there's seven thousand two hundred thirty-eight. Okay, as of and you know there's some numbers. There's a lot of funds out there. Okay, at one time. Um, in 1982, there were 852 funds with $297 billion worth of value. Now there's 7,200 plus funds with $13 trillion in there. We know open ends a big time. Will they ever go away? It's going to be a long time before they go away. And maybe they'll never go away. Because people say, oh, they're going to go away because uh, what's going to happen is that there's going to be uh, the ETFs are going to take over. Mm, they got a long ways to go to take over. Worldwide, twenty-six trillion dollars, almost twenty-seven trillion dollars. Okay. Last time, the slide. Uh, this is an updated slide. But the last time it was twenty-three point seven eight trillion. 
So there's just, you know, another three trillion dollars in money went into the funds from the last time this was updated. And it's because the markets have been good, better, and people are starting to take money out of cash and, and buying in the funds. Lots of money going there. One of the key things about funds is that small dollar amounts can be invested. Minimums are low. Are the minimums 2500 Depends on the company. 1000 500 100 If you said I was going to set up an uh, automatic checking account withdrawal feature and I'd like to open up a fund uh, at Vanguard, I could open up with uh, zero and set up that automatic and, and have them send $10 in, I think, to the Vanguard funds and they'll accept it. I mean, real low at some of these funds. Do you know what forward pricing is? Forward pricing. Um, in theory, what they're saying is, hey, in the mutual fund world, if I wanted to buy a fund, I would not know the price until the end of the, the close of the business day, find out the value of the, the shares, and I would be buying at that particular price. Backtrack. Let me say it differently. If I called my broker this morning and said I want to buy into that American Growth Fund, and I'm, you know, uh, how many shares will I get? And I said I don't know. I'm going to give you ten thousand dollars, and whatever the share price is at the end of the day, we'll divide that number into your ten thousand, and you'll know how many shares you're going to get at that point. If I want to sell my shares tomorrow morning. I, I call and said, hey, I want to get rid of my uh, DWS uh, international fund. What will I get for it? They'll say, well, you have uh, 847 shares. Whatever the price is at the end of the day tomorrow, at the close of the business day, they'll multiply that share price times that 847 shares, and that's how much it'll be paid out. All right, so forward pricing, market close. Fair value investing pricing, fair value pricing allows, there are times, you know, especially with these emerging market funds and things of that nature where they might not get all the information by the end of the day properly in place and, you know, they can speculate as to what the price would be, but the bottom line is that they could adjust the price and, you know, to make sure that the pricing was done fairly. And that's all I've seen is, is saying there. It doesn't happen that often, but it can. All right, so terminology, folks. Cost basis, again, think about if you're the uh, CFP board with these mutual funds. Would this be a good question? What would be the, uh, how do you determine the cost basis? Well, you know with the new tax law that occurred, what was it, two years ago, if I can recall, January 1st of 2012, that brokerage houses and mutual funds and all that had to be able to determine cost basis on all the shares going forward so that if anybody does liquidate and they send out their 1099B, that it will include on there the cost basis for the initial purchase or for the purchases or whatever was sold, you know, what would be the basis for those and, and the companies are supposed to keep track in the past, the investors had a tough time keeping track. They relied on their brokers and advisors to be able to come up with a share price. And uh, I'm sure there was a lot of loss in the shuffle. Now the IRS has been able to lock it down a little bit better and make sure that the companies put out the cost basis. And that's for individual stocks, too, and, and bonds and everything, any type of securities that are out there. You have to have a cost basis, All right? So, with regards to the mutual funds, notice this first bullet point. They're going to assume first in, first out. If nothing else is selected, if you did select something else, um, what would you be? You know, you have to have this written confirmation. If you if you chose that specific lot identification, or if you use the average basis double category method of short term and you know breaking them down in the short term and the long term, you need a written fund confirmation to be able to 
let the IRS know these are the shares that were used, and then you must do it the same way for the life of that particular investment. You cannot change the different mutual fund cost basis uh, choice if you chose one of these that have to have a written fund confirmation. Okay, so I know that when you cover this stuff in taxes, you'll go through this a little bit more thoroughly, but you should be familiar with the various techniques associated with cost basis. All right, I look at this particular page, which is page 6-1. And I say to myself, I don't like the title on this, Mutual Fund Investment Objectives. So sit back and think. If I said to you the Mutual Fund Investment Objective was Ginny May, what the heck does that mean? So I think this is just stated, you know, I don't like the way it's stated. The heading should not have been there. These are mutual fund types. Of funds. That's why I held off on that money market one because that's a mutual fund type. So let's kind of think before we get into this particular slide the following. And let's think about this. What is your client's objective for buying into a mutual fund? Do they have an objective? Well, what could the objective be? And there's basically only three different objectives. They could say, hey, I want current income. That's an objective, getting current income. Or they could say, I like capital appreciation. Buy it at a certain price and hopefully sell it at a higher price. I want ca I'm looking for capital appreciation. I understand that if I go the capital appreciation route, you know, I'm going to be taking more risk. Okay, but that's all, you know, further discussion. Third one. I'm looking to invest and have capital preservation. So do you know what current income means? Do you know what capital appreciation means? Do you know what capital preservation means? Those are the three things you should know. And you make sure the client understands the same thing that you understand it to be. And then from there, you match that objective to the objective of a fund that will give them what they're looking for. So in other words, if, if the client said, well, my goal is to have uh, current income, okay, you say, okay, well, current income, would you uh, pick then these two funds right here for current income? And the answer is, heck no, you wouldn't choose those. Would you choose uh, the growth and income fund for current income? No. Well, you might achieve it a little bit with that one. Which one, if I said I wanted some current income and I gave you two choices, growth and income fund or an equity income fund, which one would you choose? So I'm going to look for you guys to kind of give me an answer. Okay. I said I wanted current income and I'm going to only give you two choices of funds, a growth and income fund or an equity income fund, which one w would you choose for me? If you think it's growth in income, give me a green check. If you think it's the equity income, give me a red X. And if you don't know, give me a smiley face. Okay, so, Rebecca, any choice? Okay, all right, so you all chose that. All right, um, who are we going to pick on? To tell me, all right, so, now, did you pick it because you really knew the difference between those two funds? Or is it because everybody else had red? So, how about, uh, Julian, you got a microphone there, Julian? Oh, you stepped away, okay. How about Rebecca? Rebecca, why did you choose the equity income? Any thoughts?
And you can say pass if you want to. No mic in the chair. Okay. All right. And, you know, this is usually one of those great questions I would ask in a live class and I, because, you know, I could see the, the everybody's eyes and all that stuff and uh, and many people probably didn't know the difference or when I had trouble with this in, in the past. But, you know, growth and income fund, the first priority for the, in, for the client who's getting a growth and income fund is capital appreciation. The second uh, objective of the fund is income. Okay, so if they wanted capital appreciation with some income, growth of income would be appropriate. Equity income, its first objective is income first, capital appreciation second. Because when you talk about an equity and you sit back and say, well, wait, the term equity is, you know, implies stocks and stuff like that. Well, what kind of stocks would you buy then? You would buy uh, high-yielding blue chip stocks. You would buy convertible bonds. Uh, you know, those are the types of things that you would consider on an equity income temp fund. Preferred stock fund, that gives you more income first and then a potential a little bit of the capital appreciation after the fact. Okay, so your job is to make sure that any one of these funds that you see here on the screen, let alone the other funds that maybe didn't make it to the screen, uh, know the differences of them. You know, like what's the difference between a global fund and an international fund? Anybody want to give me a, a shot on that one? What's the difference between a global fund and an international fund? If you don't know, give me a red check. If you do know, give me a green check. At least I know that you know what, what it's all about. Anybody else? There are a couple of you don't know. Global fund, and, and again, take a note down on this one. A global fund is a, a fund that can invest anywhere in the world, which includes the United States. An international fund is a fund that will not have any United States stocks in it. Anything outside the United States is considered international. Global includes the United States. Those, so now go back to the thought pattern. You're the CFP board ready to give you a test question. They're saying the client has these particular objectives, goals in mind, so on and so forth, and they, they, they want to diversify their portfolio, and they're looking at these various types of funds. Which ones would you recommend? And they, uh, uh, and they want to have some international in there, or they don't want to have any international in there. You know, whatever, you know, they give you whatever criteria they want for that particular uh, question there and for the client's needs and concerns and issues. Okay, and then they give you a choice of a whole bunch of funds to choose from. You need to know the definitions of them, the characteristics of those particular funds. So don't leave this particular assignment without knowing that type of stuff. Okay, do you have an idea, understand the difference between a, uh, a large cap fund, a mid cap fund, a small uh, cap fund, and a micro cap fund? You know, and that's all based on size, right? What is large cap? Well, it depends on the definition you see. Some people say that large cap would be anything greater than five billion dollars in market capitalization for those uh, for the companies that are being invested in. Some say no, it's ten billion dollars in market capitalization, and small cap is a uh, billion dollars. You know. Bottom line, it's based on size, market capitalization. So you need to know market capitalization. How do you get market capitalization on a particular uh, company? You take the amount of shares outstanding times current stock price and multiply those together, and you have the market, the size of the company, with the, uh, based on its market capitalization. So you need to find what they mean by those different sizes. How about uh, a value? What's the difference between a value fund 
in a growth fund. The types of the types of funds, that, you know, the securities that are chosen. Who has the lower PEs, the value or the growth? The bottom line is that uh, value fund are undervalued. Uh, securities, uh, PE below the average for the industry, below the average for the market, and uh, versus the growth PE ratios are above and higher than the market as a whole. More aggressive in nature. Well, is it what's interesting between an aggressive growth and a growth? You know, those types of things. You've got to be able to pick that up. Look over here in the right column, Treasury Fund. Does the Treasury Fund include a Jenny May in it? The treasury Fund might be just the U.S. Treasury Securities, T-bills, notes, and bonds. Or as a government securities fund, would have T-notes, uh, T-bills, notes, bonds, and agency, government agency debt, Jenny Mays, Fannie Mays, Freddie Max, things of that nature. Okay, I used the word international before. Okay, well, what's the difference between international and foreign? International and foreign. I would think they're about the same. I don't know if there's a, a difference between international and foreign, but global includes the United States. Foreign does not include the United States. International does not include the United States. Joanne says global includes U.S. Yes, global does include U.S. Heather, international is country specific. There could be country specific. Okay, there could be, you know, those are, sometimes they refer to those as sector funds, sector for industries, sector for uh, countries. But, you know, are all international funds the same? And the answer is no. American funds might have their international fund uh, and their money managers might look at it differently than uh, Franklin Templeton, than Fidelity, than Vanguard, than, uh, you know, there's 7,000 funds out there, so anybody who's got international funds might, how do they view their international? How do they diversify? Just, just you know, this just brings up whole lots of questions. Now go back to that, remember before we get into trying to just learn a few things about some of these different funds up here, I mentioned to you what's the client's objective. Current income could be the objective, capital appreciation could be the one, or capital preservation, or a combination. So when we say growth and income, they want capital appreciation and they want income. If they have income and growth, then that's where, I, that's where the equity income came in. They want income first but they want some growth potential. If they just wanted, if they just wanted income and they don't want to worry about any type of appreciation and they want to get the highest amount of, of, um, of uh, income, would they put in there, I mean, what, what, what could they put in there? Well, just think about it. Let me clear this page off for a second. And, you know, Treasury, we know that the, you get income from government securities funds, GMA funds gives you income, Treasury funds, uh, if they want tax-free, they go to national uh, tax-free or state tax-free bonds, international bonds will get you emerging market bonds. Look at that, these are all on the right-hand side, are, you know, up to that point right there, up to ultra-short, are all income-producing funds, all bond type funds. Why don't you just put them in a balance fund? Well, they want an income. They don't want capital appreciation. Balance funds will have equities in there. And they could have capital appreciation. Well, they want to have all their efforts in the income world. So maybe you will not use a balance fund. You know, you can sit here all day and go through 99 different scenarios. But You've got to find, you got to make sure you understand what these funds represent, these names of these funds represent. Let's move on. It's already six, almost 6.30. Right, we, on this particular page, we already kind of talked a little bit about the expenses 
other things that you consider when you're picking a fund is who's running the fund, manager, management, continuity, and consistency. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, detriments, you know, why would you buy a fund or not buy a fund? You know, it could be the costs associated with the funds. Maybe you don't like the way you perform. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, maybe it's not efficient in taxes. Maybe you know they they generate too much um, turnover and 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 end up. I mean, if someone's in a high tax bracket, they're going to get all this taxable events occurring. So those could be detriments to why you know in regards to choosing a fund. And then it goes on to another page, seven dash one, just gets you more things that people will look at: fund performance, size, the services that they have to offer. When do they? If someone needs income every month, they want a fund that has monthly distributions. If it's only quarterly distributions, and they want and they need mo the money monthly, then don't buy one that just has quarterly. Buy the, the kind of funds that will give you the monthly distributions. In the mutual fund world, in the open-end mutual fund world, we have Class A shares, Class B shares, and C. Those are the, the three main ones you need to know about, and you should know the characteristics associated with them. So as an individual, um, if, if first of all, if you're licensed to sell a mutual fund and you can earn a commission, will you get paid a commission on a Class A share? Yes. Will you get paid a commission on a B? Yep. Will you get paid a commission on a C? Yep. Could you possibly get paid on commissions on these other classes? And the answer is, yeah, it depends on the company. Okay. Will you get paid on a no load fund a commission? The answer is no. But you could get paid a fee for assets under management and get paid by the client specifically or uh, by a platform that, uh, that will be able to pull out some money and send you the money or send it to your brokerage firm. Or whoever, or whatever, whichever way you're working it out with your client. All right, so let's go back to the A shares for a second. Do you know the difference between A shares and B shares? Do you know what it means? And again, I, if I was the CP board, I'd be concerned about letters of intent, and rights of accumulation. I can remember big lawsuits occurring, or big investigations by the SEC and FINRA, and in the in the SD before it was FINRA, uh, that were asking many big firms to go back to all the different trades that were made and determine did the clients uh, get the bet or they offered the letter of intent do they uh, did they get the rights of accumulation because the the broker set it up properly with the fund family all right so here's a question that I've got for you I want a, a green check or a red X do you know the difference between a letter of intent and rights of accumulation if you know the difference give me a green Checked. If you don't, give me a red X. All right, so we get one red X. I'm ready to start talking. All right, so what's the difference? Oh, a bunch of red Xs. All right, so here we go. I come into a particular mutual fund family. Let's say I'm going to the American funds, okay, and the front end sales charges. Um, there's a term here. See this? Uh, this third one right here, Commission Breakpoint Calculator. This calculator is for this. Uh, most of the mutual fund families have it on their website. Uh, they have their list of different uh, of what the sales charge would be. So let's make up one for an example. Let's say that I come in and say that I'm uh, going to invest um, $30,000 into your fund, and the and the advisor says to me, or the the broker says to me, okay, time you invest thirty thousand in the American funds. I, I want you to be aware of the breakpoints. The breakpoints indicate the fact that um, if you can invest fifty thousand instead of having a five percent sales charge, and I'm making these numbers up. Okay, I don't know exactly what the breakpoints are for the American funds. But instead of having a 5% sales charge, um, you could have a 4% sales charge if you believe that you can invest another $20,000 in the next 13 months. And I say, 
you know, I probably could because I'm going to get a bonus in, the, in a couple of months, and it's going to be a big bonus, and I'm going to, and I want to start establishing a portfolio, so on and so forth, and uh, I like to get a one percent discount on, on the sales charge. What do I have to fill out? And the answer is a letter of intent. The letter of intent says that I intend to invest fifty thousand dollars in that Amer in the American family of funds. Uh, within the next 13 months. Here's $30,000 today. But I got 13 months to get the other, the uh, the rest of the money in, and so they're saying, okay, Tom, instead of giving you a 5% sales charge, we'll only charge you a 4% sales charge on all the shares that you purchase today. And then the future shares you purchase also will get that four four percent as long as you do it all within thirteen months. And all of a sudden, I said, "What happens if I don't do it?" You know, I, I wanted to give you the next twenty thousand dollars, but something came up, and I had to use the money somewhere else. And the thirteen month period goes by. American Fund says, "Hey, no problem. They just will turn around and say." Well, we gave you a four percent sales charge on those on that thirty thousand. We're going to go back and and recoup the other one percent, and and make it officially a five percent. And they've got that worked out. You know, they already in their computer. They already knew how, what how many shares you would have gotten if you would have uh, had a five percent sales charge versus a four. And and they just go in there, push a few buttons, and they're good to go. But that's what a letter of intent is. It's my intention as an as a investor to invest enough money to get one of the breakpoints, and they're going to give me the breakpoint earlier. So you've got to understand breakpoints first of all, and breakpoints are different. You know, it's a, like a volume discount. Uh, up to fifty thousand, it's five percent. From fifty thousand and one dollar to a hundred thousand is four. Anything above a hundred thousand dollars invested into the family of funds, uh, into the equities in, in the family fund, would be uh, three. If you do more than two hundred fifty thousand, it'll be two and a half. If you do a half a million, it'll be one. If you do a million, it'll be zero. So they give you volume discount. That's what letter of intent will help. Uh, that's a breakpoint, and letter of intent is the intention of the investor to meet one of those breakpoints based on they said they could do it, but they just don't have all the money right now. So what's the difference between that and the rights of accumulation? The rights of accumulation is a situation where um, the American funds look at they look at my account and I've got twenty three thousand in there and they, my wife's got an account in there with seventeen so twenty three plus seventeen is is forty and uh, one of my sons is going to put some money in there and uh, he's going to put in ten thousand well that gets us up to fifty well based and and then the other guy gets in there and he's going to put in ten now we're up to sixty well we broke through the break point so what they do is they take out a rights of accumulation. And they aggregate all the accounts associated with that particular individual and his family or her family type of thing. And anybody who has accounts and they're all registered under this rights of accumulation and kind of connected together, that when the next dollar goes in, if they're above a certain break point, that dollar will, will be invested at a lower sales charge. Now you might say, well, and then the market goes up 20%, and so all of our money went from 40,000 up to 80,000, you know, or whatever. Great, you know. First of all, when it appreciates in value and breaks through the breakpoint areas, that's just a, you know, that's a good pat on the back type of thing. There's, there's no sales charge when you have capital appreciation, all right? So now I come in and drop in a few more dollars, and the total value is 80,000. I drop in uh, 25,000 more. Uh, that puts me up over the hundred thousand. They'll give me a lower sales charge because I will reach that break point. So the bottom line is you need to know the difference. And as a matter of fact, there was a test question on that knowing the difference between LOIs and rights of accumulation and break points and people understanding how they worked. And did the client receive that or not based on the uh, the way the 
question was written. So you need to know those types of things. Front and sales charge just means that the, the share price has built into it already a, a, an actual uh, sales charge. How do, you de how do they determine sales charges? And Well, first of all, it's stated in the prospectus what the sales charge will be. How do they put it into the, uh, you know, they take the NAV price and what do they do with it? They divide that NAV price by one minus that sales charge percent, and that will be the public, what they call the public offering price. And that would be the price that someone were to pay to get into a front end sales charge. What's the difference between A share and a B share? B share does not have any front end sales charge. It says no upfront commission percentage charge. But they get you on a back end that if you pull your money out within a certain period of time, they'll hit you with a, a percentage on the money that's pulled out. So as an example, you put a $10,000 in and there's no front end sales charge, but they have a 5% withdrawal in the first year, 4% second year, third in the third year, two and one, and then eventually after five years in the sixth year, there'll be no surrender charge. So it's just a way for the, the company to hold you on to keep your money in with them. And then they, in turn, could pay off to the broker who and the brokerage firm, so and their commissions and things of that nature, and, and and pick up some of their costs. All right. So is one better than the other? It all depends on the client situation. Which one has the lower internal fees? The A shares has a lower internal fee. Okay. Notice the second bullet point here. It has a low annual expense fee. Remember that expense ratios that we went through before. Okay. There annual expense rate for an A share is lower than the B, which has a higher annual expense rate. You need to know that. Now, one of the things about a B share, and, and if you're in your reading, you'll see that they say, well, if this back end mode, uh, you know, they, they hold the money in there for X amount of years, that sometimes they will take the B share and they'll convert it into an A share. No sales charge but they will convert the B to the A after, say, seven years, eight years, depending on the company. And then what it means is that the internal expense ratio will drop to the A share expense ratio. And it's a better deal for the client in the long run. Well, what's an issue in that in the C share then? The C share says, hey, man, we're not going to charge you a, ch a sales charge going in the door. And we're going to give you a 1% surrender charge for in the first year. And after that, there'll be no surrender charges. Well, that must be the best deal then, right? Put all your money in the C share, no sales charge going in the door, hold it one year in there, and there's no sales charge coming out the back end. But the bottom line, as you can see right here, it is the most expensive for the long term because their expense ratio does not drop. It is the highest one. You know, it'll be higher than uh, the B and, the, and this, that converts to the A and the A that starts out with the low expense. So you, you need to be able to know the different characteristics of each one of these different share classes and why one would be better than the other or when to use one over the other. Have I ever used a C share for a client? And the answer is yes. When the client says to me that, you know, I'm going to just, I want to be in this position here, but I'm going to, you know, it's only going to be for a short period of time. And then I'm going to take it and move it into another direction, either to achieve my goal and, and, and take the money out and spend it, or I'm going to accumulate a certain amount of money and then move it into a, a different type of a platform. All right, so why incur the front end sales charge? Why incur the, and be the surrender charge if it's only going to be a couple of years? Put it in C, and then a couple of years from now, pull the money out and uh, you're in a better position for them. If they happen to hold it for 8 or 10 or 12 or 15 years, then they were, they were been better off having sat, been in the A shares to begin with.
but that all comes with experience and time. And if you don't, you know, if you are not in that area of expertise, or you haven't, you know, you don't sell anything, you're going to have to learn some of those nuances. Because I believe the CFP board is going to look at it and say, all right, we don't expect you to be a broker when you finish your investment course. We don't expect you to go out and and get a license. We we expect you to understand though. When, if you're advising clients and trying to advise them in the proper way, especially if they're going to get into mutual funds, should they buy an A share, B share, or C share? Should they only go into low, no loans? How are they going to get advice? Who are they going to get it from? What kind of a working relationship are you going to have with your client? All that comes into play on in their questions. All right, so we could sit all day talking on mutual funds, and uh, but we got to move on. Potential tax efficiency in mutual funds, all right. If they have low turnover, top bullet point here. If they have this low turnover, then you know there won't be as many capital gains paid out, and you know it, it's more efficient than a, a fund that has a high turnover. Okay, internally, the money manager will be buying and selling securities within that fund. If they've got a whole bunch of gains, they might sell some of their losers to offset some of the gains so that they don't have to pay out those capital gains to the clients, you know, toward the end of the year. Because if they pay out a capital gain, it is a taxable event if it's in a taxable type of an account to the investor. So they've got all these other different things that you you know you just need to read up on. Okay. All right. Uh, one of the things about funds in general, and we're, we're, I'll be stopping it and giving you guys a five-minute break in a couple of minutes here. Uh, much of the stuff that you learned about in the packet number three, you know, about uh, alpha, sharp, and trainer, and things of that nature, beta, and standard deviation, uh, the information given on many of these funds supports all that stuff and has all that stuff in a lot of the performance measurements and the description and the characteristics of the particular funds and uh, it makes it easier to understand a little bit more about the fund and how risky it is or, or so on and so forth. Uh, why do people get in and out of the market this last bullet point? There's all different reasons why anybody sells and gets out. Okay. All right now before we jump into the uh, closing funds. I want to go back real quick to the part that I said we were going to skip over, and that was the money market. It's a type of a mutual fund. Okay. Usually, money market funds don't have front end sales charges to them. Okay. Um, notice what you you see on here. You see a lot of, you know, you have three pages worth of information on, on money markets. Only, you know, and I would believe that they spent some, a lot of, the, the author of these slides spent, you know, two or three slides on just money markets by itself because, first of all, there's a lot of money sitting in money market funds. And do you know the difference between a money market fund versus a money market account of a bank. Is there a difference between a money market fund and a money market account at a bank? And the answer is A. The money market account at a bank is FDIC insured. The money market fund at a mutual fund is not FDIC insured. The money market account that's at the uh, uh, that it's at the bank that you know has that coverage and, and it has the coverage because the um, money market accounts becomes part of the general account of the bank and and that's why it's got the coverage there. Money market fund does not have that stuff. Uh, the money market fund is subject to the Investment Company Act of 1940. It's got to follow the rules associated with uh, mutual funds in general. But no. The rules for money markets are not exactly the same rules as they are for other funds. Okay, great example would be the second bullet point here. In the money market fund, they're saying, hey, if you're buying this particular fund, at least 95%, if not more, 
of the investments that are going to be in that particular money market fund will be of the tier one level, highest investment grade, triple A, double A, those types of, of investments. Okay. It used to be five percent of this bull token. Now it's three or less percent of the assets in tier two. Um, can all, well, I think it's five percent as a whole. You know, because if there's ninety-five in tier one, the other five percent could be in tier two. But they're saying that three percent or less of the tier two investments. Um, uh, don't, you know, I wouldn't worry about. Look at all these numbers, and if I if I could never memorize these numbers, and expect you guys to memorize these numbers in regards to uh, type two investments with the cap of the greater being f five basis points or one million dollars in any single tier two issuer, you know, the bottom line is that they have rules to follow. The money managers, and you don't want to. You want to make sure that when you're putting your client into a money market fund, that you're comfortable with what they're doing inside the fund. These are things for you to know more about, more than the client is going to ever ever be concerned. Notice the amount of length of time of those money market instruments. Average weight of maturity is less than or equal to 90 days. Uh, and then they talk about tier two having X amount of days associated with that type of stuff. Now you might say, well, what are we talking about these investment vehicles? Which ones are we talking about? Well, we go to the next slide. And on this particular slide, which is slide uh, three dash two, you can see there are uh, quite a few different money market instruments. You know, you got your negotiable CDs. Well, Notice under the negotiable CDs, they've got variable rate CDs, rollover CDs, euro dollar CDs, jumbo CDs, Yankee CDs, brokered CDs, all different types of CDs. You should make sure you know some characteristics about each one of these things. In particular, see this Yankee CD here? Which is issued by foreign banks with US branches. What is the difference? between a Yankee CD and a Yankee bond. You may say, wait a minute, we haven't gotten to bonds yet. I understand that. I'm just going to point that out to you, that there was an actual comp exam question that dealt with the differences between a Yankee CD and a Yankee bond. Now, when you get into the bonds, which would be assignments 7 and 8, Package number seven and eight. You want to make sure you, you find something about Yankee bonds, and, and which in essence will say to you that Yankee bonds are U.S. dollar denominated debt securities issued by foreign governments or foreign corporations, and they're traded in the United States. A Yankee bond is U.S. dollar denominated debt securities issued by foreign governments or foreign corporations in trade in the United States, and those Yankee bonds do not have any currency risk because the currency risk is absorbed by the issuer. That's what they're asking on the comp exam. So you might say, wait a minute. I can learn everything in, in the area of taxes and insurance and retirement planning and estate planning and no investment planning, and you're going to get, and I'm going to have to know something about a characteristic about a Yankee bond? And the answer is, well, they did ask that question. So how many different investments are there in that particular textbook that you I hopefully are reading? There's a lot of different investment vehicles, and that's why I said to you opening day, hey, when you get into the looking at investments, you've got to make sure you know characteristics about those investments. You need to know, uh, do they generate income or capital appreciation or whatever the case may be? What's the tax ramifications for that? What are the risks associated with those particular investment vehicles? That's what you've got to make sure you can do. So maybe you have to write, take these particular investment vehicles and, and do an index card on it and write down some characteristics. I don't know how you're going to do it. It's up to you. Look at this T-bills. We're at the, uh, the finger pointing. T-bills are issued in four, 13, 26, or 52-week increments. At one time, it was only 13, 26, 52, which would have been three months, six months, and 12 months. 
now they rewrote the rules and said, okay, they're issuing one month T-bills. And that's why you get the, the four weeks in there. So I used to ask my qu question to my class and say, well, why won't they, if they used to have three months, six months, and 12, why don't they have nine months? And if I've been teaching this class for 30 plus years, you know, they just, I never got an answer. And I finally looked and said to myself, I wonder if the reason, this was recently, I said, I wonder if the reason why they didn't have 90 or, or nine month T bills is because of the fact that nine, nine months would be the 270 days, and maybe they didn't want to, to compete against commercial paper. I don't know if that was the reason. But I saw that and said, I wonder if that was the reason. And I said to myself, self, that's a good enough explanation. It's not relevant for the camp exam, I'm sure. But I always wondered why they never had a nine month T-bill. So maybe they just uh, decided, hey, we don't need to have too many things out there. They could buy a uh, one, one year T-bill that's three, year, three months old. And they could have a nine month T bill at that point. Maybe that was a reason. All right, so anyway, what's the bottom line on, on this money market instruments? You've got a bunch of a negotiable CDs, has a whole list of different types of things with different characteristics T bills, commercial paper, repurchase, bankers, uh, acceptance. These are all different types of money market funds that you need to know something about. This last page here before we take our break on the SEC yield, just be familiar with it, that's all. I don't think they're going to ask you to do any type of a, of a calculation. They have not done that in the past. But um, for the first time, and in, in see, I've been licensed in investments since 1981, so 33 years. And I got a call from the Franklin Funds just the other day and there was an individual uh, inside wholesaler that wanted to go over uh, like, a, like a web type of an approach and uh, she sent me an email and she said go on the email and take a look and she went, wanted to go through uh, and then I could click on to a webinar and in there she went through the difference between the SEC yield on their one of their funds versus the way they computed the, the yield versus the way Morningstar computed the yield, all three being totally different than the other ones. And, and she went through the idea that, well, one was an average, one was a compound, and, and all of a sudden I'm looking at this particular slide here, and notice that this they talk about arithmetic average on the money market fund seven day yield, but the money market fund seven day compound is a compounding effect, you know, so there's going to be a, a difference in what is going to be shown just because of the way it was computed, okay? And then here comes the old mutual funds 30 day yield, which, you know, it's just a whole different set of numbers associated with how they come up with the yield. I don't know if the SEC is just making it more difficult or not, but they've got all these different ways and I think they want you to be familiar with it. All right, I've got 658. Let's take a five minute break. And we'll start, t I'll start talking again at 703 and we'll finish up by 8 o'clock, okay? Okay, everybody, let's get, get ourselves started again. Uh, Dan, I'm reading here, if you're there, you know, is it always 13 months or up to the fund? And the answer is on a letter of instruction, uh, excuse me, letter of intent, LOI, it's always 13 months. And it's, fund cannot change that. I think that's an SEC or Investment Company Act rule about letter of, a letter of intents. Okay? All right, how about a green check if you're all here? So I know who's around. Okay, we got some of you here. All right, Valerie. 
Rebecca Dan, are you here, Dan? He probably didn't hear my answer. I was just reading what he had in the chat there. All right, let's get started. Closed end funds. All right, earlier I said to you, you had the open end funds, closed end funds, and the UITs. Those are your investment companies. When you're looking at mutual funds, open end, I said try to relate and compare it up against the closed end fund. All right. So as we go through these some of these characteristics on closed end funds, let's see if we can see the similarities or the differences between that and open end. These are traded on organized exchanges or on the uh, over the counter, right? Open end funds do not trade on organized exchanges or on the OTC. Or open end funds, you re you buy and redeem your shares from the company, the mutual fund company, mutual fund family of funds, mutual fund company. Okay, you got it. Uh, close end funds. Uh, You have a set amount of securities out there, and the trading goes on between the individuals who bought the, the shares and the secondary market. There are stated investment objectives, just like an open end. All right, here's something that uh, these would be differences compared to the open end. Auction market pricing, you know, just like a stock is sold on the on the exchange or in the marketplace, closed-end funds are sold just like stocks, supply and demand. Okay, what, this is a great one here. This fourth one: Why does the money manager of a closed-end fund have to just have a little? Does doesn't really have to have any cash on hand? Okay, look at the statement. It says, little need to hold cash or be forced to liquidate holdings to meet redemption requests since fund sales are conducted in the open market on exchanges. So in other words, in an open-end mutual fund, if there happens to be a run on that particular fund, and let's say they had um, $2 million in, in, the, uh, in the cash side of the mutual fund, whether it's a money market inside of the fund or whatever the case may be, they had $2 million in there and they had $5 million worth of redemptions. And let's assume it was a $1 billion fund. So, you know, $5 million worth of redemptions would not be a, a whole heck of a lot. But the fact is they only got $2 million worth of cash. How do they get? How do they get to the client? Uh, those people who redeemed the other three million dollars. Well, the money manager has to liquidate some of the securities, convert it into cash, and then send out the cash. All right. On a closed-end fund, if there was a run on people wanting to get out of that closed-end fund, they have to trade it on the marketplace, and somebody else is going to buy it. And people do that all the time with regular stocks. They sell because of a certain reason, whatever it may be. And somebody else was the purchaser of those particular stocks. Well, same thing in closed end fund. There's a buyer and there's a seller out there. The money manager of the closed end fund does not have to say, "Gee, I got to liquidate some of the stocks that I've got in here to, you know, to pay those that are redeeming their shares," because they don't have anything to do with those that are redeeming their shares at this particular point in time. That's, so they don't need, they can go ahead and manage the funds the way they want to. Okay, um, closed-end funds can trade at, above, or below the NAV. Do yourself a favor, take a look at your textbook, if you would. And on pages 235 to 237 in your textbook. 235, let me get mine open here. Which is the beginning of closed end investment companies on page 235. They talk about discounts and premiums at the bottom of that particular page. And they go through a scenario on discounts and premiums and, and why um, a, 
a particular fund will could sell at a discount or could sell at a premium. Okay. And do yourself a favor and and get a get feeling for that. At the same time, look at page two thirty eight. And they give you in Exhibit 7-2, they, they give you an example of what's taking place on certain shares, and they, and they talk about it in the readings. And they, and they talk about the, the various types of returns at the top of the page of 237 or 238 on, on uh, sources of return from investing in closed and uh, investment companies. That type of stuff is not on your slide. There's only one slide on closed end funds. I mean, look how many slides there was a used on the open end funds, and there's one slide here. Because after this slide here, I believe is uh, ETFs. Okay, so let's go back. So on this closed end fund, you need to be able to know a little bit more about the uh, can trade it at above or below the NAV. First of all, how many different, when we're talking about closed end funds, how many funds are out there that are closed end? Anybody know the number? Well, down here it says there's around 602 closed end funds. Well, I went online, I actually, uh, and I'm going to recommend that you do the same thing. You want to go to the website that is uh, the following website. Here, let me write it down here for you. I mean, highly recommend that you do this because you can really get a good a good read on closed end funds. What they've got in the book, the textbook mail is, is very good too. But this could supplement it. So you want to go to www dot closed dash end funds. Closed in funds. That come. And under the they they've got uh, tutorials and things of that nature, you know, on how to learn about closed end funds. Uh, but according to um, that particular closed end fund center, they said that there are statistically six hundred and forty total number of funds that are out there today and the value total net assets are 255 billion. So the bullet point down here, you know, and again it's not relevant for the exam I don't think at this point. But you know this is 602 with 265 billion. Well they said there's 640 with uh, 255 billion at this point. Okay. But they also um, give you a description of the various classifications of these closed end funds, and there's 38 different classifications. You make a holy moly, 38 classifications. You know, like uh, what class, one of the classes, it could be core funds or growth funds or options, arbitrage options, strategy funds or sector equity funds or uh, Pacific X Japan funds. These are closed end funds, and you know. The point is, be familiar with the idea of closed end funds. And the reason for something trading at or above, I was reading something, I'm going to read this to you. Um, other factors have been suggested as to having an impact on discounts and premiums. You know, why would a a closed-end fund be selling at a price below the NAV, or why would it be selling at a price above, at a premium above the NAV? And they said that uh, some of the reasons would be that the um, that the fund's relative performance, maybe the fund's relative performance was so good that there's a lot of buyers, and if there's a lot of buyers. Of you know wanting to buy that particular fund, you know it shoots that price up, and you know, and, and what is an NAV? The NAV is you know is taken, you know, the value of of the portfolio as a whole, dividing you know the net 
assets divided by the number of shares outstanding comes up with an NAV price. But because of the supply and demand, it could be overpriced, and it's, it would be selling. You know, the market price could be at a premium because of the performance, or maybe the performance was was bad. And there was a lot of selling going on, and it was driving that price down below the NAV. You know, so you bought a $25 NAV share price, you know, and you bought it for $21. You bought it at a discount. Is that good or bad? Well, hey, if you like the fund, why does anybody buy a fund? Or why does anybody buy a stock? Why does anybody buy a bond? Because they like what they see there. And they believe it's going to work its way back up. Something of that nature. Um, Maybe it has something to do with the uh, the yield and whether it was higher than they expected and they wanted that higher one. Maybe it's lower than expected and they, and they got rid of it, causing it, you know, is again, causing the supply and demand. I mean, why is something at a discount and something at a premium? It's because of the supply and demand issue, the buys and the sells. And what causes something to drop down? What causes something to go above? Uh, maybe the name recognition of the fund manager. Maybe they, the uh, the fund manager who was running that particular fund leaves the fund. Uh, people get worried about it. Man, is this fund going to do as well as it did before? And so, you know, it causes that stock price to go, the current market price to go below its NEV. It's selling at a discount because of that. Or maybe the fund gets a, a new manager who happens to be a superstar. And they're going, oh, man, I got the guy who was at Fidelity or at Vanguard or over at uh, Franklin Temple is now over here at the, the American, you know, or at this uh, closed-end fund here. And I'm, I'm following him. I'm following her. I'm following, you know, the reputation. And so I want to buy into that. I want that, that closed-end fund. So because of the a, a flurry of buys to go on. Um, maybe... What was purchased? If someone's looking at the uh, closed-end funds, what it's made up? You know, what are the securities inside of that closed-end fund? Maybe they're those. Uh, some of those holdings are very illiquid, and uh, and that and that bothers somebody. You know, maybe there's a lot of uh, built-up unrealized capital gains in there. And someone says, hey, I don't want to buy into that because if they distribute all those capital gains, uh, it becomes a taxable event to me. You know, the share price of a closed-end fund will go down after there's a distribution, whether it's an income a distribution of income or a distribution of capital gains. It'll go down in price by the amount that was distributed, just like a normal stock does that. All right, so those are issues associated with, this, you know, the fund selling at a at, at or above or below the NAV, and, and maybe that would be a good question for someone to come at you and ask you, do you understand how, you know, why would ever, why would you recommend me getting into that, that closed-end fund, you know, and it's selling at a price below its NAV, and then you could, you'd have to try to explain it to them and put it in, in terms that they would understand. All right, so um, I highly recommend that if you you read your textbook first and look at how they showed you the examples and, and, and showed you and gave you some reasons why things will sell at a discount and at a premium, show you how they come up with these percentages of gains and things of that nature, and uh, see if you can understand how it works, okay? One of the things also about... This third bullet point up here at the top, the auction marketing pricing like stocks on exchange. Can you sell or can you buy an open-end mutual fund on margin? And the answer is no. But you can buy on margin a closed-end fund. Can you sell short an open-end mutual fund? No. Can you sell short a closing fund? Yes. So those are things you want to make sure that you uh, you you learn about on closed end funds. Are the closed end funds professionally managed? And the answer is yes. 
just like the open ends are professionally managed. Okay. Uh, I guess it's about all I want to say about closed end funds. Of course, if you have any questions, please ask. Otherwise, let's go to ETFs. So, what can we say about ETFs? First of all, are ETFs, are there a lot of ETFs out there? You know, first of all, they say over here on this one bullet point down here, there's over 1,400 ETFs in the marketplace. Last time, mine said 1,000. Now it's 1,400. So I looked it up. As of 228 of 2014, there's 1,356. How much money is uh, in these ETFs? 1.7 trillion. Okay, so what was the amount sitting in worldwide in open end funds? 26 trillion or so? Well, 1.7 trillion so far in ETFs. Are they growing? Yeah. You know, when did when did the ETF start? 1993. Can does anybody know when closed end funds started? I'm gonna mark that down on on this slide here. Closed end funds began in 1893. That's when the first one came out, 1893. So here we come to the ETFs, and the first one was 1993. 100 years later, ETFs were established. Interesting, huh? Okay, so what's the intent behind an ETF? What, you know, what are active ETFs? And active ETFs are registered investment vehicles that combine the benefits of active management with one of the, you know, well, it's just active management. That's all. That's what an active ETF is. Well, are all ETFs actively managed? Some people would want to say that the ETFs are passively managed because they the trust that was formed is mimicking a um, index. That's a fir that first bullet point. Well, wait a minute. If it's mimicking an index, and the index, like the S&P 500 index, is not managed, it's a passive type of an investment. So are ETFs passive? or active? And the answer is yes. They are both passive. And they, uh, there are passive ETFs and there are active ETFs. If they just started in 1993 and there are only a couple of them out there then, and now there's 1,356 of them out there, and they have ETFs that are doing, I think that there are some ETFs that make you a pot of coffee if you want. Okay, because ETFs in the past had been passively managed, and they were, and those passively managed were just basically the track and index. Okay, well, someone's saying, hey, if we could do if we could do passive managed ones, how about actively managed ETFs? Can they could do certain things? And the answer is, yeah, they got plenty of them out there, and there's all different types. I mean, first of all, you know when you talk about ETFs. What do you think of when you think of an ETF? Do you think of a iShare? You know, I think iShares might have been one of the first ones out on the block. There's 302 iShares out there. Or do you think of, of um, State Street ETFs? Well, State Street Global is the company, largest uh, e you know user of ETFs, I think, out there in regards to uh, managing money using ETFs, so on and so forth. I mean, they, they're managing billions and billions and billions of dollars using ETFs. Um, they have 129. ProShares has 144. PowerShares has 129 of them. So who came up with these names? Wisdom Tree has it. And then all of a sudden you start getting the companies coming in. PIMCO, 
has a 22 ETFs and Schwab has 21 ETFs, things like that. And then you've got uh, somebody like uh, Franklin Templin, they have one ETF. Or Russell, you know, they have one ETF. Fidelity has 11. More and more companies are coming out with ETFs, and it's complicated. If you ever try to describe how an ETF is made, it's not that easy, right? So the bottom line for you and your client going forward is that, uh, you know, it's just why why were ETFs established? Well, look at the date. If they came out in '93, what was the problem? Well, we had Black Monday that occurred in 1987, wasn't it? And when people couldn't get out of their mutual fund uh, on that day when the, the market dropped 20 percent on that day by itself, and you told me that mutual funds are are pretty liquid, and uh, and I said, yeah, they are. You know, you can you know you can get out by the end of the day. And you said that was great. I thought, gee, I just thought I had to wait a long time. At the end of the day, that's fine. But when the market's going down and it's at 8:35 in the morning, and you're saying, get me out of that mutual fund. And I said, okay, we'll get you out of there at the end, of, but it's at the end of the day. And you sit there we're watching the market go down 20%, and the value of your $100,000 uh, mutual fund went down to 80. You're upset. Maybe it wasn't liquid enough for you. So then all of a sudden ETFs come out, and if you would have had that same fund that or that was, uh, let's say, very similar to, uh, you know, a great example would have been the Vanguard 500 index fund. You can't get out of the Vanguard 500 index fund until the end of the day because it's an open and mutual fund. And if the S&P as a whole went down 20%, so did the Vanguard index 500, 500 index fund. But now if you had an ETF that mimics the Vanguard 500 index and you wanted to get out at, 8, at 835, you could trade out at 835. Okay, that's the second bullet point. Marketable auction, market pricing on exchanges, and look at this on the, this fifth bullet point down here. It's different than index funds, open and mutual funds, because these particular ETFs can be bought and sold in multiple times during the day, which means any time during the day. They could be shorted. They could, you could sell them short, you could buy it on margin, you could put stop limit orders you know, to get out after in a certain, you know, if it hits a certain price. You can't do that on a regular mutual open end mutual fund. Okay? They say that there's options and put options exist on many of these ETFs. So the bottom line, it's a big tradable type of a security, isn't it? And it duplicates a lot of times a lot of these indexes that are open ended. Competitive expenses. Okay. Uh, used to call it low manage, uh, management expenses, but it's competitive expenses now. Meaning what? Is 56 basis points competitive com uh, when the average mutual fund is maybe 100 and, 101 basis points? Sure, that you know an extra fifty basis points difference makes a difference. Okay, so so what's what's your takeaway on these ETFs that you should be familiar with? You know, are they the similarity and or the differences between ETFs to closed end funds? You know, a closed end fund is a type of an ETF. It's traded. You could short it. You could put buying on margin. You could have stop limit orders in there. You can do all the same things, but you know. So the ETF and the closed end have similarities, but they are different though than the open end funds. And that's how you've got to make sure that you can sort that out in your mind going forward, so that when they come at you with a question, you'd be able to know which way to go and how to get there. Okay. Uh, is there anything else that we want to say about ETFs? Uh, I, was, I looked at a State Street Global Advisors uh, little brochure on, and here, let me just kind of read a couple quick things to you. It says, ETFs and index mutual funds are similar in that each holds a collection of securities intended to represent a specific investment theme. Okay. 
uh, or objective you know, uh, but what's different about them is the pricing and they say okay the pricing ETFs are bought and sold during the trading hours mutual funds at the end of the day how about ETFs in regards to tax consequences ETFs investors decide when to sell their ETF shares and any associated capital gains taxes there's a loan to pay go back to what happens on an open end mutual fund remember I mentioned to you that if there's a lot of redemptions and the, and the fund manager in an open end had to sell shares so that they would have cash to be able to pay to the those that are redeeming their shares okay well then either they took a loss they took a gain whatever what if they were taking your selling some of their winners and took some gains well eventually if they don't have any losses to offset those gains they're going to have to distribute those gains to you at by the end of the year so all of a sudden you as a regular investor in that open-end mutual fund that you're holding onto those shares all of a sudden get a taxable event and you're going to have to pay taxes on those gains well if an ETF you know someone in the ETFs wanted to get out they get out and trade their shares has no impact on the other ETF holders just like it doesn't have any impact on the closed-end holders and we already talked about the cost of ETS being, you know, in the ballpark low, 56 basis points and, and lower. It used to be, you know, you looked at it as 20 and 30 basis points. But I guess the active, active ETFs are going to have that higher 56, 60 uh, expense ratios in there versus the more passive ones are going to have lower expense ratios on the ETFs. Okay, just like the expense ratio of the Vanguard 500 index fund is lower than an actively managed mutual fund of of uh, blue chip stocks. Okay, so you know the, the, to say that a mutual fund historically has an average expense ratio of a one one oh one uh, or you know uh, one 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 hundred one basis points uh, is not fair because there are other ones out there we all know that there will always be exceptions to the rule in all different types of of funds and or ETS or closing funds that are you know could give you a different look a different approach okay so uh, nothing more to add on those exchange traded funds which leads us into exchange traded notes and notice in big print there's like four bullet points on the exchange traded notes and that's all and why well first of all not so many people know about these exchange traded notes there's a lot to learn about exchange traded notes uh, and they're structured very much like an ETF but it's there are some differences and you know and first of all the indifferences are that uh, they're kind of hard to understand and, and and figure out exactly how they do work and what anything that I read on exchange traded notes and, and I looked for it in you know is it is there an exchange traded note here in uh, in the mail textbook let's look in the back I don't remember Let's see, exchange traded funds, arbitrage, convertible teachers. Oh, page 715. Okay, 715, all the way at the end is exchange traded notes. <laughs> yeah, uh, one line. There are even exchange traded notes which are debt obligations of the issuing firms in regards to. Uh, they make a statement that there are exchange rate notes out there but they don't get into what they're all about all right so I took and I went into uh, Investopedia or Wikipedia about exchange rate notes and I said an exchange rate note or an ETN is a senior unsecured unsupported debt security issued by an underwriting bank similar to, similar to other debt securities so debt securities your bonds 
Unsecured means they don't have any backing to them. In other words, you know, they're you know, if they're secured, maybe uh, equipment or uh, buildings or land could back it up. Unsubordinated versus you know, debt security. You know, it's it's lower on the totem pole. Those ETNs have a maturity date and are backed only by the credits of the issuer. So what are they? What are they around for? ETNs, according to Wikipedia, says they are designed to provide investors access to returns of various market benchmarks. All right. So remember, if e <coughs> excuse me, if ETFs came out and they were passive investment vehicles that were matching the indexes out there at a low, at a you know, and to combat the open end funds that also matched the indexes, but they wanted to have them be tradable during the course of the day at any given time, and be and be and you can sell them short or buy them a margin or put all these stop limit orders in or whatever the case would be, and are more tax efficient, so on and so forth. ETNs are also. ETFs, but they just call them exchange traded notes because they're debt like. And there's only a few of them out there. There aren't very many of them. Okay. So ETNs do offer a tax efficient way to invest. This statement down here on the bottom about non currency ETNs treated as a prepaid forward contract. So, bottom line is if you held it. You know, the, the I guess exchange traded notes will only be taxable after they mature, and they mature usually after a one year period of time. Thus, any type of in, uh, the income and the capital gains that are generated are all taxed as long term capital gains because they say there's no taxable win until the ETN, ETN is sold or matures. All right, so. Since there's not a lot of information in textbooks supporting it, I would believe that you, you, there won't be that much testing on it, except for you to be aware that they're out there. And just another new vehicle to play with. And it's an ETN is almost even like a structured note, or a structured product, and the structured product is the last slide in this particular assignment. Another type of investment vehicle that not a lot of people know about. But here's one that a lot of people do know about, UITs. Oop. Holding company, holders. UITs will be coming up, I think, right after this one, right? Yeah, all right. So what are holders? All right. Some of these big firms out there, like Merrill Lynch and uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, all that, um, came out with this type of investment holding company depository receipts called holders. Notice that it did not have to follow the Investment Company Act of 1940, so it's not an open-end fund, it's not a closed-end fund, it's not a UIT. Um, short-term investing type of uh, vehicle. How are they different than ETFs? They show you how they're a little bit different than ETFs with a couple of characteristics here. And the bottom line is that I don't believe any CFP is using these holders. I think you're just being made aware of it. Um, my broker dealer, I've been with them for 25 years, never heard anything ever coming up about this. It's usually for those high net worth clients uh, that are, you know, and for some reason they just have to find some more specialty things to get them into. And it's a very highly sophisticated type of an investment. So I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Just be aware of them. That's about it. But here's when you should lose some sleep over. You got to know about UITs. And um, in mail, 
on pages 239 and 240, so there's two pages devoted to UITs. The way I would approach it if I was in your shoes is take a look and make sure you understand the characteristics of a UIT. Okay. It is not a blind pull. A UIT is usually, a blind pull means that you don't know what the investments are going to be in there and eventually they're going to be putting in them, you buy into it and they're using the money to buy certain things and create that type of an investment. Now, this is not a blind pull. This is one that already has a package of bonds or a package of stocks. You already know what they're going to be buying. And you, and you say to yourself, do I want to get into that or not? Okay. It's a fixed portfolio of securities over the life of the trust. How long do they run for? Could be short term. Uh, could be a couple years. Could be five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. It depends on how they structure it. Is it actively managed? The answer is no. But is it professionally managed? The answer is yes. What's the difference between professionally managed and actively managed? Actively managed means that they buy and they sell and they replace and you know and put more in there and take some things out and, and trade and do it. No, these are established securities, whether they're bonds, stocks, or whatever they're they're packaging in this UIT, and somebody's gonna monitor it. That's why they call it professional management. So there are, are there any ongoing management fees? And the answer is not really. Will there be some up, upfront cost? Yeah. Could there be some break points? Depends on what's being offered, what firm and what firm. It's, it's, it's not uniform across the, the table, you know, across the industry. Um, when, will they ever mature the securities inside of the UIT? And the answer is yes, next self liquidating. So in other words, if by chance, say it was a UIT of bonds, and they and they decided to get rid of a bond. You know, they could get rid of a bond. They just don't replace the bond. So if they were going to get rid of the bond for whatever reason, maybe uh, something was happening in the company and they wanted to get out before uh, the the company was going to default or they thought it was going to default or whatever, and they wanted to get out of that particular bond and, and sell it on the secondary market, the money that they get from the sale will be dispersed to the investors or distributed to the investors. Okay. But they don't go out and, or take that money and buy another bond and put it back in. If it's a UIT of stocks and they wanted to get rid of one of the companies of the, of the stocks of, the, of a company that they bought, they don't go and buy another company's stock and put it in there. So there's no replacement. Of it's a packaged, set portfolio, professionally managed, not actively managed. It usually has an end period, at which time, at the end period, they they will liqu they liquidate everything in there and they give and they distribute out your portion based on how many shares you owned. How big of an industry is it? Uh, and I mentioned see if they can do stacks and bonds. And okay, there's what do they say, fifty-seven, five thousand seven hundred eighty-seven UITs in the United States worth about seventy-one billion dollars as of 12-12. And then the total UIT is 151 since 12 of, you know, it, it's gone. Yeah, uh, let me backtrack for a second. I can remember UITs were very hot in the early 80s. And then because interest rates were coming down and all that stuff, they stopped selling the UITs. It was 1981-82, and I'm sitting uh, in my office. I was on leave of absence from the. I was a high school counselor and administrator, and I took a leave to learn more about this business. And so here I am sitting in my office. My office was my kitchen at my home. I had no idea what was going on in this business world, but I was going to learn. And I can remember Naveen sending a UIT number seven, twelve uh, percent, twenty year, which is long term UIT for twenty years, twelve percent tax free, 
with the bonds not being able to be called away. It had a call feature of 10 years. So that means that they could not unload those bonds for at least 10 years. And it was like a $20 million established portfolio. And number seven came by, you know, was in my mailbox on Monday. And then number eight was in there on Tuesday of $20 million. And UIT number nine was in there on Wednesday. And UIT number 10 was in there on Thursday. I'm going, wait a minute. They're already sold out and they already started a new UIT? And, and the answer was it, it was selling out as quickly as it came to the marketplace. I didn't know what was going on, didn't understand what was going on with interest rates, and I, it wasn't relative, you know, to me, they were high, but aren't they always high? I didn't know. But that's what, what happened back then, and, and luckily I sold a UIT to my mother-in-law and a UIT to my folks, so I was a good son-in-law as well as a good son, because they got 12% tax-free for 10 years. And then when they were called away, you tell me, with interest rates coming down, the value of those UITs was higher. And uh, they got a premium on their shares. Oh, I should have sold my firstborn, is what I should have done. And the secondborn, and the thirdborn. You know, because, you know, you, will we ever see that again? The answer is, who knows? Not now. That's for sure. Not for a long time. All right, so these UITs, they, they say, are often themed. Well, there's UITs of many bonds. There were UITs of uh, maybe of, of stocks in a particular industry. They're often sold in $1,000 increments. Uh, sometimes there's minimums of 5000 to get in the door. Sometimes uh, they're $100 units. But the minimum at Naveen at one time was I think uh, five thousand to get in, you know to buy the UAT. Can any of the underlying securities default, and that would be in, in reference to the bonds? The answer is yeah. So they would come out with insured UITs. So on an insured UIT, maybe uh, the uninsured was seven point five percent yield, uh, and the Insured was 7.1, and you might say, "See, for 40, you know, 40 basis points, I'll take the insured ones, and then I have to worry about things." But some people said, "Hey, I, I'm not worried about it. I'd rather get the 40 basis points and yield." Now, what is insured on a UIT if it's bonds? All right, I'm going to make it up. If you had a UIT of 16 different issues each $1 million in value in one of those issues, uh, and it was an insured, do they insure each one of the 16 different bond issues inside that UIT? Or do they just in insure the UIT as a whole? Different companies did it different ways. If each bond was insured individually, it cost the UIT a little bit more for that insurance, but if they had to get rid of UIT number, th you know, bond number 13 that's inside of that UIT and there are 16 of them in there and they had to sell it, they were getting a higher price than selling it out there because it was insured. The insurance followed the bond. And the people, you know, who bought it were uh, assured of what? When you have an insured bond, somebody is guaranteeing that when the interest payment is should be paid, it will be paid. If the company went belly up and, and actually defaulted, the insurance company will step in and pay the interest, the coupon, on that particular bond when it came due. And then when it matured, they will pay the principal out. Okay? So that's why those bonds were good uh, if they had to be resold out there. If it was uninsured and you try to sell that bond, you'd get a lower price. Right, so those are little things about the UITs that you you know you, you learn from being in the business, but at the same time, you might they might ask you a question about you know you have a client in front of you, and they have fifty thousand dollars that they want to put 
in, into their portfolio, into the debt side, you know, into the bond areas to help diversify their portfolio. Would you buy individual bonds with 50000 Would you buy an open-end fund with the 50000 Would you buy a closed-end fund with the 50000 Would you buy into ETFs? Or would you buy that, which, you know, because before there were no ETF bonds, now there are. Um, would you buy a UIT of bonds? And you need to be able to break it all down in your mind and, and, and know the risks of having individual bonds outright. Can you diversify enough? Can you buy a package of UITs and be diversified? And the answer is yeah. Can you have a, a certain amount of income stream that you you could be a, you know that you should be pretty well assured of? Yeah, buy the insured UIT if it's available, and you've got a, a guaranteed income stream coming in for a certain period of time, and that the bonds will you know when they come due you'll get your money back. So that's I think where the CFA board will be looking at you understanding those themes, those concepts, those ideas, the philosophy, the strategy of when to use these investment vehicles, and thus you must know some of the characteristics of the investment vehicles. Okay. That's what I've said on UITs. How about REITs? How big of a market is the REIT market? It's huge out there. But then again, how huge is it? First of all, the mail text will give you about four or five pages from page 240 to 244. We'll talk about REITs. Okay? All right. Your job is to know the characteristics associated with REITs. I'm going to come back to this page, to the next page, which is the 12 1, I believe. It says to you, hey, you, you ought to know that in the tradable, and REITs that are, that are traded, there's equity REITs, mortgage REITs, hybrid REITs, finite life REITs, and private REITs. Okay. Let's hold off on this private REIT. Those are your non-publicly traded. Okay. Um, there's non-traded REITs. And there's private REITs. You know, those could be different ones. But let's go back up here on equity REITs. How many people believe there are, in regards to the number of REITs that are out there in the in the in the real estate marketplace, there are are there more equity REITs or more mortgage REITs? If you had what would you think, more equity REITs or more mortgage REITs? And so here's how we're going to vote. If you think there are more equity REITs, I want a red X. If you think there are more mortgage REITs, I want a green check. So there's the REIT industry. Green check says there's more mortgage REITs out there than there are equity REITs. All right, so so far we got three on the mortgage REITs. And one on the equity rates. Waiting for Heather. Heather, are you there? Are you going to give us a vote? And the winner is. Oh, we, we got uh, Valerie also has a. Okay, we got four on the green and two on the red. And the answer is that there are more equity rates than there are mortgage rates out there. I believe. There's 90%, used to be about 80% or so, equity REITs, 12% or so mortgage REITs, and the other ones are hybrid REITs. Hybrid REIT is a combination of equity and a mortgage REIT. Then recently, I remember reading something that says there's 90% equity REITs out there. So they, it does change a little bit. But the bottom line, a lot more equity REITs. Here's another question for you. Which one would you like to use? Which REIT would you rather be in, an equity REIT or a mortgage REIT, if inflation is, is taken off, if inflation is going up and interest rates are going up? Would you rather be in an equity REIT 
or a mortgage REIT. So if you would rather be in an equity REIT, give me a green check. If you'd rather be in a mortgage REIT, give me a red X. Inflation is going up. We're in inflationary times. Would you rather be in an equity REIT? Green check. Would you rather be in a mortgage REIT? Red X. Which way would you rather be? All right, we've got a split decision here, folks. Three and three, and the answer is you'd rather be in the equity REIT in inflationary times. Because in inflationary times, that means rents are going to go up, and if rents are going to go up, a lot of times the value of real estate property is your net, net operating income divided by your the cap rate. It gives you the value of the property that you're looking at at that point, and net operating income comes from all your gross rental receipts plus any other income that would come in from that particular uh, you know 8 flat or 12 flat or whatever you say so you have that, that type of a building and then you subtract from it the uh, operating income or excuse me operating expenses no you, you would you would subtract from it uh, vacancy up you know value if there's any vacancy in those buildings. And then you would subtract all the operating expenses and you come up with the net operating income. So if you, you would you like to have higher rents, which means your gross rental receipts would be a lot higher, and the answer is yeah. So, and that was a question on the comp exam, believe it or not. All right, so the bottom line is you need to learn about these equity REITs and mortgage REITs and, and learn, you know, the idea behind them. Okay, let's go back to the previous page. And the previous page kind of said that uh, uh, these are right here two of the key things that you have to make sure you remember about REITs. That 75% of the income of a REIT must be derived from real estate or some type of real estate loans that the uh, for that particular REIT. Okay, I'm going to read it to you in other words, out of a textbook I got at least 75% of the gross income must be derived from real estate, usually rents, mortgage interest, and gains for selling real estate. For this REIT to maintain its status as a REIT, at least 75% of the income must be derived from real estate type of investments. And that could be rents, selling real estate properties, mortgage interest, whatever. Then the, the next one, I'm going to skip that 90% for a second. At least 75% of the REIT's portfolio must be invested in real estate. So this one says, 75% of the, of the income must be derived from real estate. Also, you want to know that 75% of the REIT's portfolio must be invested in real estate, which would be like loans secured by real property or mortgages on real estate, on real estate or shares in other REITs. Uh, or government securities, things of that nature. So 75% of gross income must be derived from real estate. 75% of the REIT's portfolio must be invested in real estate. All different types of real estate. This distribution, 90% of the income must be distributed to the shareholders. So they only can retain about 10% of the income. 90% must be distributed. If it's not, it loses its REIT capacity. A couple other numbers that are not on here that came out of this tax thing. It says that there must be at least 100 shareholders for this REIT to be. So you got to have at least 100 investors. And that no more than half of the outstanding shares may be owned by five or fewer individuals at any time during the second half of each taxable year. Now, you might say, wait a second. I got to remember those little rules like that in regards to 
you know, the first half of the year versus the second half of the year, and that's, you know, they're not going to expect me to know that for the comp exam, and, and I would have to agree with you. I think the point I wanted to make was that at least you got to have 100 shareholders, you know, and then there's always these little sub things that go on, uh, and I don't think they want to, you know, so if I was testing you, I'd be concerned about the 75% and the 90%. That would be the key on that. Okay. These REITs are traded, marketable, traded on exchanges and over the counter. They're professionally managed. Okay. So, no characteristics about REITs. No the different types of REITs. Know that a finite REIT has a date that it could be called, you know, that it ends. Many of these REITs are, don't end. A finite life REIT, a free, they call it, terminates at a future date. And when it terminates, the party's over. All right, that's your REITs. Now, hedge funds. We only got two more to go. Hedge funds and structured securities. And I you know it's 7:15. It will be done in about three minutes. You might say, "Wait a minute, we got, you know, we got four, five, six slides to go through." Well, let's kind of put hedge funds and private equity funds in the perspective here. Look at the amount of hedge funds that are out there in the United States. Nine thousand. And how many funds were there? Seven thousand or so. This is an ugly area. It's it's scary. Um, the amount of legislation, the security, the rules that they had to follow were almost nil. Some of these hedge funds come on, and you, and and if you ever interviewed a hedge fund portfolio manager, sometimes they wouldn't know half the stuff they got in there. You know, I was in the business, and I did. You know, and I said, "Okay, I've heard about hedge funds." And and then when I read that there were nine thousand a month, there, I go, "Well, where? Who's buying into this stuff?" And there's an awful lot of money being sent into those things. So, last bullet point down here, this uh, Dodd Frank bill started to say, "Hey, we got to get some more legislation." And I don't know if if one of the reasons why they said the SEC can't go out there and and supervise all those money managers out there that are, you know, doing various things and managing more than $25 million and they raised it up to $100 million before the SEC uh, gets involved. So now they're saying to many of these particular firms, you better register. we got to know who you are, wh what you're doing. So if you got $100 million or more, and these have much, much more than $100 million. All right. Um, one of the things that I think would be important is to say, well, can we describe what is a hedge fund? And the answer is, yeah, hey, a hedge fund is a fund that can take both long and short positions. What does that mean? If you take a long position, that means you buy into this, you buy the security because you expect the price to go up. If you take a short position, you sell it and you expect the stock or the security come down in value and then you buy it back, you know, selling short. Well, you know, there were hedge fund people out there that were selling short and never went through the proper rules associated with selling short. They never had to come up with the security to offset it and to, you know, they're sold something and, and, and then you have to come up with a certificate to, you know, for the person who bought it because when you sell something to somebody, or some institution or whatever, someone's gonna, you know, someone's in essence buying it, right? So, you know, they said, hey, there's got to be, there's no more selling short without, you know, following the proper rules and stuff like that. All right, so a hedge fund is fund that can take both long and short positions. They can use arbitrage. They buy and sell under secured, undervalued securities. They trade options or bonds. They invest in almost any opportunity in any market 
where it foresees impressive gains at a reduced risk. That's what their goal is. The strategies vary enormously out there. There are many, many different types of strategies. So I would recommend that you know not to rely just on uh, these slides. And I don't believe, let's see, where do hedge funds, I think there's only a page or so on hedge funds in here. Let's see what page it would be. Let's see, we got hedge funds. Hedge funds, 284, 251, let's see, 284, let's go to page 284 and see what they say about hedge funds. There's no hedge funds in 284. 251, let's try 251. See if there's anything in 251 hedge funds. And. Hmm. Maybe there's a line in, in one of those pages on 251 that says there's a hedge fund. Let's see if there's another spot in this book. Hedge funds. 248 to 251, okay. Hedge funds and private equity firms start on page 248. Let's write that down on there. Page 248 to 251. So I give you about three pages on the hedge funds. Do yourself a favor and uh, just become familiar with some of the terms associated with hedge funds. As you can see, and I'm going to get off this page, that second the last bulletin on the bottom here, it is largely unregulated. I can't believe that they let them out there without really cracking down, because when a multi-billion dollar hedge fund goes belly up, I have to believe that other people suffer because of that. Um, they're limited to the type of investors and how many investors they can have in there. Uh, they're not very liquid. Look at this last bullet point on this slide here about the general advertising and soliciting is prohibited. How big is hedge funds? Let's see. Uh, peaked at two and a half trillion dollars in 2008, and there's about two trillion in it now. I mean, that's that's a lot of money. Uh, a lot of endowments and pensions get into that type of stuff. Big family members. Again, this is not for the little guy out there. It's for the big ones. You got to be accredited or super accredited. Do you know on an accredited investor that they have to have a million dollars worth of invested assets to be considered accredited? That's invested assets, not counting the value of your home. If they are put into the classification of being super accredited, that means that they have $5 million of invested assets that they can invest. Okay, if it was an entity and not an individual, the accredited has to have five million dollars as an entity or twenty-five million if they wanted to be considered a super accredited. And that last bullet point on there, president, principal resident values are excluded from the calculation of invested assets. All right, so lots of money out there. Usually, it's for the high net worth type individual. They employ a lot of these different strategies. That's what they're, that's what, what this page is all about. So just be familiar with that. They have fund the funds of hedge funds. They get compensated pretty well, these money managers. So the bottom line is out of this whole assignment on packet number four. If if you had to say I got I've got to put my time in somewhere, then I would say make sure you know open end funds real well, and then the difference between those open end and the closed end, and ETFs, the other one and REITs. Those are your four areas. The other stuff is just newer stuff. Uh, not a lot of information. They're not going to hit on it too heavily. But know that most of that other stuff is for those high net worth clients. 
in the last slide on structured products. It's growing. There's only about 300 billion in there. There's different types of structured products. And I bet you that if you had someone say, uh, let's discuss structured products, and there's 25 money uh, CFPs sitting around, um, probably 24 of them don't know much about structured products because we don't use those things unless you're going to deal with the big money. And if you are, then you're zeroing in a different area in particular. So I don't know uh, if they're going to expect you to know much about it other than there's one page on it. And we'll call it quits. 809, that's enough. Uh, and uh, in that chat area that you mentioned, is it always 13 months or up to the fund? I don't know if you heard my explanation. The bottom line is it's always 13 months for a letter, a letter of intent. It is not a fund family. They can make it longer or shorter. I think it's an, uh, a Investment Company Act 1940, one of those rules that a letter of intent is 13 months. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions, concerns, comments? If not, Thursday we're going to get together again and we're going to start stocks. And then there'll be a week off next week. No classes Monday or Wednesday. And then we'll finish stocks that following Monday. And then we'll start in binds on that following Wednesday. All right. Anybody got any thoughts, concerns, questions? If not, have a great evening. Nobody? Okay. And I'll see you uh, Thursday, guys. Take care.